Um, my name is uh, Tim van Herrick. I head up the, the, I'm director of uh, technical product management at uh, VMware. Uh, NSBU, uh, part of the VLocalad acquisition that uh, closed uh, just under a year ago now. Uh, and uh, what I'd like you to do today is walk you through some of the key uh, functionalities that SD1 has, some of the rationale why you want to move into SD1, and then give you a couple of like real world examples. And you can see on the opening slide that uh, uh, I'm missing a partner in crime, uh, Frank uh, from QS Network, uh, had a late minute cancellation, so he's uh, going to apologize for not being here today. Uh, but I'll uh, cover his part of the session there as well. So before we dive into uh, SD1, uh, I do want to position a little bit first on like where uh, SD1 fits into the larger uh, VMware portfolio. And, uh, we started out with uh, delivering on a vision uh, called a virtual cloud network vision. Uh, and that is uh, providing a uh, connect and protect uh, uh, capabilities so for making sure that we can uh, connect any resource on the network uh, and at the same time protecting those resources uh, while we do that. And the way we deliver on that vision is by uh, moving a lot of these components and delivering those as software uh, today so that we can uh, scale out uh, these components as uh, performance and scalability requirements uh, move along. And that we also have the ability and the flexibility to deploy those components on any x86 uh, uh, hardware, commodity hardware that you can deploy to them. So if we dive into some of the components uh, in the product portfolio today, so like uh, the way we deliver all of those uh, software elements is uh, there are a variety of elements that you see on the bottom of the screen here. One of them is the most uh, common one is the NSX data center. So that is delivering software defined uh, data center components. And it's providing you all of the networking and uh, uh, firewall capabilities in the data center to ensure uh, that you can replace some of the legacy hardware implementation routers in the, that facilities. Uh, we also have our NSX uh, cloud uh, capabilities, uh, which is delivering uh, the same kind of uh, facilities, but in uh, cloud providers like an Amazon or Azure today, so that you can mirror the capabilities that you have in your physical data center and move those out to the virtual data centers as well. Uh, we have our app defense uh, capabilities, which are uh, providing like micro segmentation capabilities and ensuring that you can uh, a baseline how an application should behave on the network and then uh, protect against anomalous behavior that happens uh, at the application. So instead of working with uh, individual ports and scanning those ports, uh, you can uh, look at the behavior of the application uh, to make sure that it's still operating in uh, its core capabilities. Uh, all the way at the right side, we have our hybrid connect uh, capability. So that is a mechanism to uh, make sure that you can move applications very uh, seamlessly between cloud as well as on-prem data centers. Uh, but what we're going to focus on today is the NSX uh, SD1 uh, capability, uh, and that is a recent uh, addition to the NSX portfolio. And it's providing that uh, hybrid capability of connecting branches in a very seamless way and an automated way uh, into uh, both cloud applications as well as existing data center applications. But before uh, we go there, uh, I want to sort of like step back a little bit and go a little bit uh, on history uh, and see where branches are, uh, the, how they are deployed to today in uh, existing uh, network enterprises. And you see this is sort of like a classic uh, network diagram uh, for uh, most of the enterprises today. So we see on the right hand side, a classic data center. Uh, and that data center is connecting to multiple branch locations. Uh, all of the branch locations are connected with an MPLS link, which we use as an active link. Uh, and then it's usually uh, using a dedicated internet access or a broadband link as uh, a backup link. So we're using IPsec tunnels over those internet links to back up the MPLS capabilities. Uh, the objective is always to uh, move the applications uh, into the data center and uh, ensure that like, the branches can consume uh, the applications in the data center. But then, of course, over the recent years, uh, additions of SaaS applications have a common uh, occurrence uh, in these uh, deployments as well. So we, we do see uh, several uh, inefficiencies emerging uh, in that uh, deployment that you saw on the screen there. Uh, the first one is uh, not really a new evolution. Uh, it's an evolution that's been in the, uh, uh, going on for like a small decade now, uh, where we see more and more applications moving away from the data center and into cloud uh, services. So that brings the applications out uh, to the customer base uh, in a more low latency fashion because the applications are now uh, distributed uh, and we want to make sure that we synchronize the applications over all of the available regions and not just wholesale centralize them into a data center. Uh, one of the natural uh, reactions to that, of course, is that we see less and less data centers being deployed and that there are active uh, efforts going on to actually consolidate some of the data centers into fewer facilities uh, or even translate them into virtual data center facilities into the cloud. 
Uh, another um, evolution uh, in that same uh, margin is that uh, we, we see more and more um, uh, critical applications moving into the cloud and also real time applications uh, moving into the cloud. So these are voice services, uh, transcoding services for uh, uh, facilitating video conferencing. Uh, and at the same time we see that um, we have these internet links available but there are not really SLAs available to uh, these applications. So that makes it very hard to have a predictable uh, application delivery into these uh, environments. So if we scroll back and we look at like okay this PBX service is now hosted into a, a data center application. It's connected with an MPLS service. There is a strong SLA associated with those services so it's actually relatively easy to ensure that that application is delivered uh, in a reliable fashion. Once it moves into the cloud now we're relying on broadband links or DIA links where we don't have packet delivery guarantees anymore. And it becomes more uh, difficult to ensure that there is quality delivery of that application into the cloud. Uh, of course uh, related to that is uh, that we, we do see that if we want to reach those SaaS applications so the best way uh, with that uh, current deployment is to actually backhaul the application through the data center over your MPLS link uh, and then going back out to the SaaS application because our broadband links are usually set uh, there as a uh, true backup link. Uh, we're not going to locally break out of those branches so we're going to backhaul always to the data center uh, and do a central firewall facility uh, to actually get to these applications. Uh, but it also means that we're, uh, we're burning very expensive capacity with that MPLS link to go to a really uh, commodity application that we would be able to reach over our broadband links or our internet connected links as well. Um, so if we look at the branch uh, side of the house, uh, a lot of the, the drivers for actually moving into SD1 are about cost pressures of the, uh, uh, the branch location. So if we look at uh, what the, the primary cost driver is for a branch today, the operational cost drivers of a branch today, we see that a lot of the large ticket items are related to that MPLS circuit. And we see a lot of customers uh, exploring the idea of actually complementing that with DIA links and ensuring that we can sort of like deliver these applications over a series of broadband links and start reducing uh, the volume of MPLS capacity. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to completely uh, eradicate MPLS from the broadband mix but we uh, w customers are definitely looking at ways to reduce uh, the dependency on MPLS and make sure that we can actually go to cloud applications in a more direct fashion as well. Uh, and historically speaking if you look at uh, these MPLS so the way people have been uh, getting around uh, the, uh, uh, the cost of uh, MPLS is to deploy uh, a CAPEX solution so it's uh, by deploying one optimization uh, into those branches so that we can do data deduplication and compression on the branches and squeeze out every little uh, amount of bandwidth over the MPLS links uh, that is available. So instead of like um, sending data uh, a couple of times over the network we're going to make sure that we can cache uh, the data uh, at uh, both uh, the branch location and the data center location and then reduce the amount of uh, MPLS capacity that we need at those uh, certain times. Uh, but as a result uh, and that's the next uh, actually before we get there. Uh, let's uh, look at uh, some of the, the differences between uh, the MPLS and the broadband link. So on the left hand side we look at the extreme of the spectrum where MPLS capacity has been uh, used for a long time already in enterprise branches so that's a very reliable way of uh, getting uh, into uh, uh, branch locations because it's, it has dedicated access capabilities, has dedicated core capabilities, uh, it has a strong SLA both in terms of availability as well as packet delivery capabilities but the downside is it's relatively expensive. Uh, we see somewhere in the 50 to 500 dollars per meg range especially when you go into international locations uh, especially in Asia pack um, it's not uncommon to see it uh, going up to the higher end of the spectrum there. And another complication with uh, MPLS links is that it takes uh, a really long time to get them delivered uh, as well and we see uh, a lot of uh, especially retail environments that need to come online very quickly and uh, people have a dependency to get those uh, uh, environments rolled out in a matter of days uh, rather weeks uh, but not necessarily months. Uh, and if we go to like some of the larger carriers in the world um, it's like there is not really a single carrier in the world that has global coverage of MPLS so they will always need to work with other uh, vendors uh, in the space to deliver the last mile circuits. Uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons why these uh, contracts uh, take uh, real long uh, to implement uh, in the field. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum we have our broadband circuits. Um, so these are uh, shared uh, environments. Uh, we're working with both shared access uh, in case of like cable uh, medias for example uh, but also having a shared core capability. Uh, and as a result there is not really an SLA so this is really a best effort circuit uh, and we're going to try to do the best of our ability to uh, deliver the applications over that broadband circuit. 
Uh, the obvious advantage, of course, is the cost aspect of it. It's relatively ex uh, inexpensive, so one to three dollars per megabit. Um, so that's very easy uh, to digest uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and also the delivery uh, mechanism uh, is a lot uh, more uh, uh, in tune with what uh, administrators uh, uh, would expect from a provider these days. So in a matter of like a week, you can deliver a broadband circuit into an environment uh, and as a result get us on, uh, online very quickly. Uh, of course, there is also wireless uh, broadband capabilities like LTE or even 5G capabilities that are a matter of uh, can be delivered in the same day, and it's actually very portable uh, transport uh, mechanism at that time. Uh, somewhere in the middle, we have our dedicated internet access link. So these are business-grade circuits that uh, enterprises consume uh, in order to get to the internet. Uh, these are uh, often delivered as fiber uh, into the environment directly. Uh, now we're somewhere halfway in terms of like cost. We're looking at 10 to 30 megs uh, uh, per uh, per megabit uh, today, uh, and the delivery time uh, is also somewhere in the middle. So it's a matter of like a couple of weeks that it can get uh, delivered. Uh, but we don't really have like uh, packet delivery guarantees at this point. We have an availability guarantee uh, associated with the circuit, uh, but not necessarily a packet delivery guarantee. Uh, and all of this uh, basically is driving, uh, like if we, we look at like adding one optimization into the branches, maybe we want to have like a dedicated like UTM appliance in the branches. So a lot of that capability, uh, like in order to get that capability into the branch, it drives complexity, right? So you're looking at an equipment stack now of different devices that uh, offer uh, different solutions at a time. Uh, and you have a dependency now on a local IT administrator to ensure that that stack is operational. Uh, if there is something going wrong with that stack, um, it, uh, like if it is a complex failure, it takes a longer time to actually bring that uh, uh, stack back online. So one of the drivers uh, for a lot of the uh, branch locations is to actually reduce some of the complexity out of the branch and move a lot of that functionality uh, into cloud applications where it's uh, uh, best of breed deployment. We have dedicated staff from that uh, cloud provider to actually actually administer that application and all of the infrastructure uh, related to that application as well. So, uh, and uh, by the way, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to stop me at any point in time. I think there will be uh, a gentleman in the back with a microphone, so uh, always uh, welcome to take any questions. Uh, but uh, the SD1 solution is basically looking at mitigating uh, a lot of the uh, issues that we've looked at so far. Uh, and it's uh, providing the capability of actually using any transport uh, in the branch today, uh, working with a simplified one management so they have full insight into how uh, the links are performing at a given point in time and which applications are on the network. Uh, and also providing these uh, on-ramp capabilities to cloud applications so as we see uh, more applications shift uh, from uh, uh, enterprise data centers into cloud environments, it's very important that we get these like on-ramp capabilities uh, into the SaaS applications to ensure that that application can be delivered uh, in real time. Uh, and we do see now um, more and more enterprise consumers actually going to a cloud-only strategy uh, where they exclusively consume cloud services and have no longer dependencies on uh, enterprise data centers. So if you look at uh, Gartner, um, so Gartner defined the SD1 uh, strategy or the uh, SD1 solution as having four key uh, components uh, in the solution. So the first one is to have uh, transport independence. Uh, so the ability to, for, to connect any circuit that you have available at the branch and connect that to a, a UCPE or a CPE device uh, and con uh, consume that broadband, right? So it's not a matter of like which type of bandwidth, so broadband LTE or even MPLS, but it's about like private capacity versus public capacity. Any capacity that you can basically get uh, at the branches should be able to be used uh, for uh, facilitating uh, transport. Uh, the next one is uh, secure overlay capability. So it's uh, the ability to actually build up a VPN uh, connection uh, that interconnects all of the different elements that are uh, connected on the enterprise network so that you can connect um, existing legacy data centers. You can bring on uh, IaaS applications in the cloud. Uh, you can bring on branches and interconnect all of those in a very reliable uh, and secure fashion as well. And then, of course, we also want to protect the infrastructure at the same time, so there should always be firewall capabilities uh, to protect that overlay uh, transport uh, on the cloud. 
Uh, the third uh, item is the most uh, uh, important item is our dynamic uh, path selection capability. So this is the ability uh, for both uh, applications or like the ability for uh, setting policies on an application basis. So you, that you don't have to worry about like ACLs where you set the port and uh, the IP address of the application, but uh, you now actually go to a catalog of applications and you can identify that application in a very natural fashion. So we're not looking at individual ports, but you can simply say it's Facebook that I want to block from the network. Uh, and more importantly, uh, all of that uh, uh, business policies uh, that we'll uh, look at a little bit further in uh, the presentation, uh, we're going to set these uh, in an environment where we measure the quality of the links in real time so that we can make very uh, strategic decisions on which applications goes over which uh, link as well. Uh, and then the fourth component uh, is something that uh, uh, is um, historically missing from a lot of legacy routing infrastructure today is a simple interface. Uh, and it's not just a simple interface for the administrator today uh, so that as an administrator you can go to an intuitive UI where you can both set the policies and the configuration but also monitoring the solution on how that is uh, operating today. Uh, but it's also about um, uh, DevOps uh, 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 people that uh, need to uh, like interface with REST APIs into existing OSS and BSS system so it should have like a REST API capability uh, to both configure and monitoring the solution as well. Uh, and then last but not least uh, there should also be a zero touch uh, provisioning aspect to it so that the technician that goes on site and deploys the solution should have a very simple mechanism to actually deploy that. Uh, that they don't need to necessarily like uh, have an understanding of like which, uh, which link is available in which port that link uh, needs to be plugged into uh, but that that's all uh, automatically uh, discovered uh, and that it uh, reacts to change in the network as well. So let's uh, dive a little bit uh, more into the architecture of uh, the uh, NSX SD1 solution. So we have uh, effectively like two major architectures. Uh, the first one is our uh, enterprise uh, deployment architecture where we uh, run in a true over the top service. So there is no service provider participation uh, in place. We just consume uh, service provider circuits. Uh, so any circuits uh, including uh, private uh, circuits like MPLS circuits can be included into this mix today. Uh, and there are um, three major components. See if this works. Yes. Um, so we have our uh, edge devices that are installed at the branch location. So these are small appliances. Uh, have a different uh, range of appliances all the way from like 50 to 30 meg uh, range uh, all the way into multi gigabit uh, environments. Uh, we have the capability of actually clustering some of these appliances together to get into multi 10 gig environments if that is needed for a branch or a data center location. Uh, and that uh, device is uh, basically there to connect to the physical circuits uh, directly. Uh, and it is um, uh, an, a true SDN appliance that basically connects to a segregated control and data plane. Uh, and the control plane is our uh, VLOCloud orchestrator that you see on top here. And that is the uh, portal where the administrator interfaces to. Uh, and it is the uh, central uh, facility where you can configure all of the policies for the solution, uh, but also monitor the solution as well. And it also serves as a REST endpoint. Uh, so any OSS BSS system that you need to uh, configure, that will interface with the orchestrator appliance directly as well. And then uh, last but not least we have a series of like cloud gateways uh, deployed uh, in the solution as well. So these are offered uh, together with the orchestrator as a service today. So as an end uh, consumer of the uh, solution uh, you wouldn't have to worry about uh, those. So you would simply get an account to the orchestrator and then you have immediate access to a worldwide uh, set of deployed uh, gateways that provide you with these off ramp services uh, into cloud applications. So as an enterprise consumer the only appliance that you will see is the edge appliance that goes on site at the branch location uh, and at that time when the first appliance that comes online you would have immediate access to uh, about 30 uh, worldwide locations to offer them to uh, both SaaS and IaaS uh, uh, applications. Orchestrator as well uh, also delivered as a service today so you will simply get an account on that orchestrator and then have the capability of configuring and monitoring. Uh, and I should also mention that both the orchestrator as well as the gateways are uh, offered in a multi-tenant fashion today. So uh, we have the capabilities of having uh, multiple uh, enterprise consumers uh, deployed on those environments. And we also have like uh, managed service provider roles that as a managed service provider you have the capability of managing multiple enterprise consumers uh, while uh, logged on to the system as well. Uh, and then of course uh, I should also mention that uh, the edges say basically they built like an overlay towards the gateways uh, and that is uh, something that we'll explore a little bit more in depth on how that works but that is that uh, secure overlay uh, that Gartner was talking about. 
Uh, and I think I forgot to mention uh, one last thing on the Gartner slide is that uh, uh, Gartner recently uh, recognized uh, VMware and VLOCloud as uh, um, a leader uh, in the Magic Quadrant. So there was, uh, I think, uh, earlier um, in, in October, uh, the Magic Quadrant for the One Edge released, uh, in which uh, VLOCloud uh, and uh, VMware was uh, set up as a leader in the uh, upper right quarter. So it's a very, a very important recognition, sort of like uh, indicating that we have a leadership position in the market space there. Next, uh, going to the service provider architecture. And this diagram looks uh, relatively similar. So component-wise, we're looking at the same components. So we've got the edge appliances, the orchestrator appliances, and the gateway appliances. Uh, but you see that the gateway appliances are now uh, positioned in a different uh, uh, place in the network. So they're actually gonna be placed at the edge of the service provider network. So it could be uh, placed at the internet edge, or it can be placed at the uh, private core and PLS edge. Uh, and the difference uh, here is that we now have the capabilities to actually build overlays towards the MPLS uh, edge uh, devices as well so that we can consume the MPLS uh, global services uh, natively without building an overlay there because in, keep in mind these are like very expensive services but as a result they've got a very solid SLA in terms of like packet delivery capabilities. So there is in some cases not really a need to build an, uh, an uh, SD1 overlay over the core of the network but the probably the reliability issues that we're facing uh, and we're trying to address with SD1 are primarily towards the last mile uh, circuits. Uh, and um, as a result, like since that uh, you built the overlay towards the MPLS core, you can actually now consume uh, 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 applications that are offered out of the MPLS core as well. So as a service provider, you can offer an SD1 service to your customer base and include and complement it with the existing applications that you're already offering from the MPLS cloud today and still provide these like off-ramp services uh, into existing SaaS applications as well. So this is uh, commonly done. Uh, we have uh, several uh, large uh, service provider customers uh, that offer this as a solution uh, today in the market space. So let's uh, dive a little bit more in detail in some of the core functionalities of the uh, SD1 solution. And the first one uh, is going back to that simple interface uh, that uh, Gartner was uh, mentioning. And uh, the way we do the zero touch deployment uh, is we always took a design uh, uh, angle uh, to ensure that we can actually drop ship devices into our branch locations and that non-technical personnel at the branch location should be able to bring up the device with minimal assistance uh, or even zero assistance in some cases. So the way we do that uh, is uh, a three step process. Uh, so the first step is for the administrator. So this is the network administrator now is to log on to the orchestrator and provision the device on the network. Uh, and what you will need to do in order to provision that device is uh, a couple of uh, different things. You have to give it a name basically uh, and you have to associate it to uh, a business or like a profile. And the profile will tell you how that edge should behave in the larger enterprise context. So it will tell which interfaces to use, like what networks to deploy on there, what uh, subnets uh, it should deploy in those branch locations. And then of course like how it should treat applications uh, over the network as well. Like which applications are important to the business and which we should protect and which applications are not important important and I should let go out to the internet directly or even deprioritize as well. So once you've got that uh, device uh, provisioned uh, in the orchestrator, uh, what you would do next is, or like in parallel even, uh, you can drop ship the device into the branch location and we use a, a concept of late binding where you don't necessarily need to have an understanding of like which device goes into a branch or what the serial number of that device is into the, uh, that goes into the branch. So once the uh, network administrators provision the device, uh, we're gonna generate an activation key. And that activation key is gonna give the uh, device on site uh, the capability to bind with the correct profile and then download all the profile settings. So once the administrator has provisioned that, he's gonna send an email to the person on site that will install and activate the device. Uh, so now person on site uh, receives both an email as well as a device uh, in the mail. Uh, and there's three simple instructions uh, and that's going to the second uh, step of the, um, the easy interface is that that person, uh, the uh, store manager for example, has very simple instructions to get that going. So he looks at his email uh, and he basically, uh, the instructions are unpack the device, uh, connect it to power, connect it to the network uh, and we don't really care where you plug in which link into the network. So the device will, uh, during the activation, it will measure uh, which uh, provider is connected to which port on the network and then it's also going to determine how much bandwidth is associated to it as well. 
Uh, once uh, the networks are basically plugged in, um, the uh, instructions will tell the administrator or the local uh, site admin to connect to a temporary wireless SID that the device emits. You can also connect to a wired uh, connection on the back of the LAN interfaces. And then you click on an activation uh, link in the email. Uh, and that uh, link will have the uh, activation key that the administrator uh, uh, provisioned earlier on. Uh, and at that time, the device will actually call back home to its orchestrator. It will exchange, uh, authenticate itself against the orchestrator. Uh, it's going to use that activation key to identify what the role is of that device, bind itself to the correct enterprise, bind itself to the correct profile, and then start downloading all of its policies and installing those policies. So in a matter of less than a minute, uh, you're going to have a fully functioning network based on all of the provisions that an administrator did maybe weeks in advance already. Uh, so as soon as that device is activated, like the very next second, the administrator in, uh, uh, can log back on onto the orchestrator and start looking at like which links have been connected to that device, uh, what is sort of like the bandwidth uh, that is being connected to each of those uh, devices as well. Uh, and in the event that you uh, do have links with static IP addresses, uh, so the uh, administrator can also pre-provision some of the static IP addresses uh, and uh, it will be embedded into the activation link. So if, the, uh, if you click on the activation email at that time, it will first provision the IP addresses, test connectivity towards the internet and then activate itself as well. So there's a variety of options to ensure that uh, the person on site at the store or in the branch location doesn't have any uh, uh, complicated interactions with the device. Uh, and I, sh I should also mention, so this is our default uh, activation mechanism or deployment mechanism that we use today. Uh, it's called our pull activation mechanism. We also have a push activation mechanism where you pre-provision the device and actually bind it to an actual serial number so that you can stage the devices and then ship them out in a central fashion as well. So that's also a supported option today. Uh, next up is our dynamic multipath optimization and uh, uh, DMPO in short uh, is uh, a key uh, technology that we use uh, in the SD1 uh, and it's uh, uh, what sets it apart from sort of like legacy routers as well as so, uh, from most of our competitors today. Uh, and uh, DMPO is basically comprised out of a couple of uh, major components. The first one is our uh, deep application recognition. So this is going to inform the edge devices on which applications are actually on the network. Uh, and uh, it also provides the uh, understanding of like what the applications need from the network. So if you're detecting a voice application, we're automatically going to identify that that voice application will have uh, propensity to gravitate towards uh, a low latency link uh, and a link that has uh, no packet loss. Uh, while uh, maybe a bulk file transfer application, we want to spray it out over multiple links and actually aggregate the capacity over, uh, of the multiple links to, uh, together. So first step, DAR uh, will tell us which application is on the network, so that gives us a good idea of like what is going on uh, on the network and like who's using that application and a lot of those statistics will actually flow back to the orchestrator so that as a network administrator you have central capabilities of reviewing those. So the next step is that important uh, uh, difference is so to actually do real time measurements of the connected links. So I mentioned earlier as well as as soon as you connect a, a link into the, the device, into the, the edge device, the edge will actively measure uh, that uh, network. So it's first going to do a bandwidth test where it's going to look at how much bandwidth is available. It does that both in an upstream and downstream fashion. Uh, but then it's going to instrument every single payload packet that goes on the network and it's going to uh, timestamp that with uh, high precision timestamp information so that we can infer uh, how much latency is on the network, if there is packet loss on the network and if there is jitter on the network as well. So now we know which applications are on the network uh, and we know what these applications need from the network and we know how the network is behaving at that time. So now we have two uh, critical pieces of information to make very smart decisions on what to do with that application and how to send that application over the network. So we can make again these decisions where if we do detect voice traffic on the network and we see one link with high latency, another link with low latency, we can make a simple steering decision towards the lower latency link. We also have remediation capabilities so uh, that in the event that there is packet loss or high jitter on the network that we can actually actively uh, steer around or like uh, remediate uh, the effects of that. Uh, we can do that with forward error correction techniques or de-jitter buffer techniques so that we uh, normalize uh, the effects uh, on the application itself. So let's look uh, a little bit deeper into the deep application recognition engine. Um, 
Uh, it's actually an engine that uh, covers about uh, just shy of 3,000 applications uh, today, uh, and it's an engine that uh, works with a deep packet inspection engine on the back end, so it's not just looking at port uh, information and destination IP addresses. It will look at certificates, it will look at heuristics of the applications to identify what application is on the network. So even though you may have an encrypted application, there is a good chance uh, that we can still uh, um, uh, identify that application as well. Um, we also have a caching database, so every time uh, an application flow is on the network and the deep packet inspection engine uh, classifies that application, we're going to cache that uh, uh, information so that the next flow that comes online, we can do a very quick convict of that application and then immediately place it in the right uh, business policy. Uh, and we also have uh, a static database of known cloud applications, so if you look at uh, Salesforce, for example, or even Microsoft, uh, Azure, uh, they operate on well-known prefixes uh, that uh, uh, tend not to change uh, too frequently. Uh, so we do have a, a database uh, in place that actually can uh, look at those prefixes and by looking at those prefixes uh, immediately convict an application as well. And this is uh, updated on a regular basis uh, so that we make sure that we always track uh, the correct applications. So next let's uh, look at uh, what the effects are of that DMP on the network, right? And if you look at the orchestrator uh, and you go to one of the edges, uh, you will see a couple of like different uh, graphs. So the first uh, um, uh, is a link status overview and it will tell you which provider link is connected to which port on the network and it will tell you how much capacity is associated with each of those links both in an upstream and a downstream fashion and then provide in real time latency, uh, jitter and packet loss characteristics as well. Uh, so all of these characteristics are also done uh, in a, a bi-directional fashion so uh, it is perfectly reasonable that we actually do asymmetrical routing is that you take like uh, one DIA link for the upstream part but then for the downstream part you may actually take a DSL link. So there is actually not really an issue with that. It's actually preferred because it will uh, ensure that the application be delivered uh, in the envelope of the SLA as well. Uh, and of course like if uh, that uh, happens like the, the gateways and the edges have the responsibility to normalize the flow again and reconstitute the flow so that it's been, being delivered uh, on the remote end side as it was it ingested on the origination side. Uh, next thing that we do is we have this uh, screen called the quality of experience screen and those are uh, two that you see on the bottom. Uh, and what we try to do with these screens is we're going to score the links on how well they're performing in order to deliver, uh, for example, voice applications on the network. So we're going to look at each of those links. These are the before capabilities. So this is our uh, wireless link and this is our uh, UVerse link in this case. And we see that on the network on a routine basis we have an impairment on the network where we have, uh, for example, packet loss or latency characteristics. So if you hover over one of those time slots, um, I think you will see that uh, the jitter uh, is basically impaired in a lot of these cases. So uh, easy thing to do over here is to basically like make a steering decision if you're looking at this link for example, if the voice traffic is over there we can simply make a steering decision towards the other link. Uh, we can also look at uh, another application type. So if we look at transactional applications, so just web browsing, uh, then we see that these applications have far less dependencies if there is packet loss or jitter on the network. So for those applications, uh, we wouldn't necessarily take any uh, uh, actions. Uh, if there's, of course, packet loss on the network, uh, then we would take uh, corrective actions as well. Uh, but it's important to point out while we're at this slide is that like all of those business policies that we were mentioning are enacted on a per application basis. So you may have like multiple links, uh, one link that is uh, exhibiting packet loss and one application will be able to survive that and we won't make any steering decision. While if it's a voice flow that goes over that same link we would actually take that voice flow and move it uh, uh, on a per packet basis to a better uh, performing link. Uh, and also important to point out is uh, that we can do this mid flow. So we don't do this on a per flow basis uh, where uh, if a flow gets locked down on, an, uh, on a certain link device or on a link and the link degrades that you would have to reset the session and reestablish the uh, session to get to a better uh, performing link. No, nope, we can actually do this uh, while the flow is uh, in place. So as soon as it's being detected, we can take the very next packet and move it over to a better performing link at that time. So that's very important to immediately react to impairments that you observe on the network uh, and ensure that the application can still be delivered. <coughs> So let's uh, look a little bit uh, deeper in uh, like how DMPO error correction works. So if we look at uh, a couple of like links here, we see like an MPLS link uh, and then a cable link uh, that is being connected and you see that uh, all of the links are sort of like exhibiting quite a bit of uh, issues on a regular basis. Uh, we see even like uh, some outages here like these 
white spots that you see here are uh, cases where the MPL link, uh, MPLS link simply goes offline. Uh, but if you look at the after scenario where like we include all of the dynamic multipoint optimizations, we can see that like for our voice traffic we are still able to perform like deliver a, a quality network uh, to that application and towards the end user there is nothing, uh, there is no noticeable uh, performance degradation or quality degradation on the voice calls. It's a very important uh, capability uh, that is there today and it's uh, one of the primary drivers why we see customers uh, gravitating towards SD1 solutions today. So um, like in this uh, case uh, we see both like upstream uh, loss on uh, both of the links so even though um, like there is overlap in loss on both of the links simultaneously uh, we can enable forward error correction on these uh, links and then still on a per, uh, per application basis mitigate the effect out uh, of that uh, loss. So we can also uh, have a similar mechanism for uh, reacting to jitter. So jitter is a very destructive property for uh, voice traffic uh, as well. So that's uh, what uh, usually creates like a lot of uh, in uh, um, uh, noise on the network. So it's very hard to understand uh, the other person on the site. So it's really important for voice traffic to normalize the jitter on the network. And if we do have cases where uh, there is sustained jitter on uh, one of the links and even sustained jitter on the, uh, the other link as well, that we can de-jitter buffer and artificially slow down some packets on the network uh, but to normalize uh, the uh, uh, latency variations on the network for that uh, application. So in the end, uh, voice quality is basically guaranteed under these jitter conditions. Uh, and the way you control this is by our business policy framework uh, and we try to take a very simple approach as well. So going back to our uh, simple UI uh, approach where we have like a simple uh, match uh, and action criteria. The match is basically defining which application you want to enact a business policy on. Uh, and uh, most of our customers actually use our application category where we go into the deep application recognition engine and then pick an application by its very natural name. So this is where you can say Facebook, uh, I want to uh, enact a policy on that. Uh, and for certain applications we can actually go into uh, a sub application as well. So for Facebook you can say like uh, disable the messenger uh, or like if there is Facebook video you can deprioritize that on the network as well. Uh, if you do have an application that is not uh, part of the DPI engine, you can still uh, fall back to your normal uh, five tuple definition. So source IP addresses, destination IP addresses, source port, destination port. Uh, protocols uh, that can all be defined in those uh, categories as well. Uh, we also have the capabilities of matching on host names or even on domain names uh, as well there. And then the next item is you have to specify an action on how you want that application to be treated by the SD1 network. Uh, and the first thing uh, to do is basically like mark uh, what that application uh, is in terms of priority. So if we mark an application as a high priority, we're going to use all of the techniques uh, in the network. So forward error correction techniques, steering techniques, aggregation techniques uh, to ensure that with the available bandwidth that we have, we can deliver that application uh, to the best of the capabilities uh, connected to the uh, edge device. Uh, other item is uh, that we can uh, also make sure that uh, in uh, with the QoS that we have available uh, that we can use the overlay mechanism so that we're going to use one of the gateways so that's our one multipath and it's going to use the dynamic multipath optimization or if it is an application that we don't really care about like if it is Facebook we want to send that directly on the network uh, directly off uh, to an internet link and get it off the corporate network as soon as possible. Uh, it's grayed out in this particular example. We also have backhauling capabilities to send application, for example, to a CASB provider for further inspection before it goes out to the internet. Uh, or through a central uh, data center facility that you have already set up where you may run like an IPS service uh, today and you want to leverage that uh, to uh, further scrub uh, data. Uh, and then uh, last but not least, like if you do select uh, the direct uh, capabilities, you can actually constrain which links have been, uh, will be used to, to actually send that traffic out. So um, there may be cases where you say like I've got LTE uh, links connected to my edge device but I don't want to use that unless it's for like a, a real disaster uh, event. Uh, so then you may actually have a transport group uh, that is constraining that application to go out direct over just the wired uh, connected links. Uh, and in most cases like if you do use our deep packet inspection engine it will automatically categorize the applications in the network and then automatically uh, um, uh, set up a QoS policy for uh, the individual applications. 
and our uh, QoS uh, scheduling uh, works by a three by three matrix. So we have nine uh, uh, classes of uh, scheduling today. Uh, you can influence uh, how each of the classes are basically how much bandwidth they uh, take of uh, the available bandwidth today. Uh, although we don't really see a lot of customers uh, influencing that. And uh, one thing that I should uh, mention here is that it's uh, in the SD1 world, uh, QoS actually works in a, a, a very different way. Uh, like if you look in QoS in traditional network and you have like an MPLS link of 10 meg, you would set 2 meg aside for your voice traffic and that's perfectly predictable at that time. Uh, but now we're dealing with uh, multiple broadband links uh, where bandwidth and available bandwidth actually may vary on a real time basis. So you can't really set fixed policies. Uh, from a QoS perspective and all of the, po the policies that we have uh, today are going to be on a percentage basis. So we can say 35% of the available bandwidth is going to be determined for real time high priority applications and that's the way we preserve that bandwidth. So let's also, also look at our cloud VPN capabilities. Um, so um, that was another uh, key uh, aspect of the Gartner uh, capabilities uh, where we need to provide that uh, secure overlay uh, and uh, we went uh, one step further with the secure overlay and provide you with a mechanism where it's very easy to sort of like um, uh, build topologies on a per application basis as well. So uh, you can have uh, certain applications that flow uh, over a certain topology but other applications that use a different topology. Uh, the first uh, uh, thing to, to note is that we have capabilities of connecting what we call non VLO cloud sites. So these are uh, sites that don't have SD1 capabilities. So this could be, uh, for example, an Amazon VPC or an Azure VNet uh, that doesn't have a virtual edge deployed, or it could be an existing data center uh, that you want to interconnect with a standard based IP sector. And the way this would work is that like each of the edges will actually meet up at a common gateway and that common gateway will build a standard based IP sectional into uh, the Amazon VPC. So it provides you with uh, a good set of like aggregation capabilities because once you bring a new branch online, so if there's a new branch that comes online, uh, if that profile says that you need to be able to access that uh, VPC capabilities, the edge device will automatically build that overlay tunnel into that uh, common gateway and then provide access uh, uh, into the Amazon VPC. So you don't have to make any changes on the branch to facilitate that transport, nor do you have to make any changes on the Amazon VPC or onto your centralized data center facility. So a very easy way uh, to aggregate uh, capabilities and aggregate uh, that access into this uh, legacy environment. Uh, we also have the capabilities of uh, nominating certain sites as hub sites. So these are going to be sites uh, that have been deployed with uh, a physical edge device or a virtual edge device. Uh, and these hub sites are going to uh, act as a transit uh, mechanism to either uh, provide access to uh, resources hosted out of that uh, facility uh, or uh, have the capabilities of actually doing backhauling uh, of uh, applications through that data center. Uh, and once you nominate uh, a location as a hub site, uh, there is going to be a dedicated overlay tunnel built uh, from each of the edges towards that hub site capability as well. So you don't necessarily need to use a gateway to egress uh, to that uh, uh, site. Uh, and then last not but not least, um, we can also have of course like capabilities for branches to exchange traffic directly. So by default uh, we use the gateways, um, so like over here for example, uh, to facilitate that transport and the gateways serve uh, as a, a waypoint between the two edges. Uh, so there may be a different gateway for every pair of edges in the network, uh, which in terms allows it to scale to very large number of edge devices. So uh, you don't have constraints uh, on the edges in terms of like number of IP sec tunnels or overlays that you can build, uh, uh, nor uh, of any routing protocol concerns, but the edges can basically like uh, exchange traffic between uh, uh, each other as long as they find a common gateway. Uh, and there's also a capability like if the gateway is too far away or uh, if uh, the uh, application SLA requires to have a shorter path and the edges can actually build a direct overlay tunnel uh, on demand uh, between the, the devices as well. Uh, in terms of uh, routing capabilities, uh, we have uh, very predictable routing capabilities I should say and uh, all of the routing capabilities that you see on here are basically like targeted towards ingesting routes from the LAN side. So uh, OSPF is sort of like the preferred mechanism to enable on the LAN side. Cover that. Uh, and uh, uh, ingest the routes from a downstream layer 3 switch or layer 3 router uh, and uh, ingest those uh, routes into the network. Within the core of the SD1 overlay we actually use a proprietary routing protocol. 
but uh, at the edges we uh, fall back to standard uh, based routing protocols and the reason why we do take that uh, proprietary routing protocol is because it needs to scale to very large numbers which is not something that OSPF or BGP will be able to do. And it's also intended to uh, work with like a multi-tiered uh, mechanism so it's similar to like BGP route reflectors uh, where it can actually scale out to a very large number of uh, edge devices. Uh, so BGP is also a supported uh, technology. Uh, it's uh, not commonly used on the LAN side, but we use that uh, primarily on the WAN side to interface with an MPLS PE router. Uh, and once you do that, uh, the uh, edges can act as a full uh, MPLS CE replacement as well, uh, where they directly interface uh, with the PE router of the service provider and establish a B, uh, BGP session. Uh, we also have the capabilities for like if you are working with like legacy routers that don't have like OSPF and BGP support capabilities. We of course uh, support static routing as well but we added like IP SLAs uh, with uh, automatic tracking capabilities. So if you're unable to uh, reach that router that we're going to automatically retract the static routes from the database. Uh, and all of the routing capabilities are actually rolled up into something that we call uh, OFC which is uh, short for overlay flow control. Uh, an overlay flow control uh, is sort of like a generalized uh, enterprise wide routing table. Um, so think of your entire SD1 uh, uh, network as one ginormous router uh, and every branch on the network uh, basically becomes a port on the router. So once you go into the orchestrator uh, and you click on the OFC table you have full visibility in all of your prefixes uh, on the entire network and you can also inspect where these prefixes are being learned from and which sites have those prefixes available. So it gives you a very uh, easy capabilities of troubleshooting routing loops in the network and identifying like where these prefixes are originating from. Uh, you can also look at uh, a variety of different uh, uh, community tags uh, that have been ingested by BGP. Yes, it was a question. So. Uh, yeah, so the, the question was about uh, address family support on uh, the BGP side. So today we do only a V4 at this point. Uh, so V6 is on our uh, roadmap and that's going to be delivered uh, early next year. I mean, uh, if you won't implement, so, so you, you say it's replacing the CE, so, so then uh, you, you don't, uh, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the BGP will uh, interface with the PE router. It's going to be a single tenant session at that time. Uh, and uh, we will be able to learn all of the routes from the underlay and then uh, you have the option to actually re-advertise those routes into the overlay and that's the default mechanism so that you can uh, use actually those sites as transit sites. So if there is a remote site that is internet only and it needs to reach uh, a location over uh, the MPLS uh, site you can actually use a, a, a hub site or a transit point on the network to uh, ingress into the uh, MPLS uh, overlay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, the question was around uh, um, BGP advanced capabilities like filtering. Uh, so we do have uh, all of the capabilities that you would expect. So we have uh, route map capabilities where you can do an AS uh, prepend. Uh, you can do uh, community tags on there. Uh, you can do uh, 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 a prefix uh, match on there. So all of those capabilities are in there and you can have a variety of uh, different options. So the classic recommendation especially with um, uh, SD1 networks is to use community tags uh, very liberally so that you have uh, in the OFC table you can quickly identify like where routes are basically originating from but all of those capabilities are there today. Yeah, so the, the question was about uh, like uh, what is the extent of that overlay uh, uh, routing protocol or that proprietary routing protocol. So that is constrained uh, within the SD1 network. So it's between the edges and the gateways, between the gateways uh, and the orchestrator as well. So uh, from an administrator point of view, there is no exposure to use. It is all hidden behind the scenes. So there's very little uh, that you have to do. But you can review uh, the capabilities through that overlay flow control table. Yeah, the, the, the question was about like is, it, is there a capability of uh, building multiple overlays? So uh, yes, so like especially if you go into the over the top uh, deployment, um, you would tend to build an overlay over all of your public links and then you would tend to build like in a separate overlay over all of your MPLS links if you want to use uh, an overlay mechanism. You, you still have the capabilities of actually using the underlay natively as well so that's really a policy decision that you can make. But by default it will build overlays. 
Uh, one last uh, capability that I want to quickly touch on is we do have uh, segmentation capabilities uh, available as well. Uh, segmentation is actually um, uh, a mechanism that allows you to uh, um, like install uh, segments in the network that are fully isolated from each other and that can actually run different VPN topologies uh, and have uh, differentiated business policies as well. So you can have like one segment uh, where you uh, may have all of the enterprise consumers on and you may want to block uh, Facebook traffic on there. You may have a guest segment where you simply like allow all of the traffic uh, to flow out uh, to the internet but you don't want to actually use uh, any of the remediation capabilities. Uh, but what this is commonly used for is for PCI uh, segmentation where uh, PCI is basically a payment card industry standard uh, where there is a regulatory need uh, to have these uh, segments uh, in place and where all of your payment terminals uh, need to be on a completely isolated network. So that is something that you can establish there. Uh, if you want to go uh, and compare this against uh, classical networking you would have to uh, deploy VRFs at each of the CE locations. Uh, you have to organize a transport uh, towards a central facility and that transport can be either an IP sectional over your uh, broadband connections or it could be uh, a VLAN tag over your MPLS connections. Uh, so in the uh, SD1 uh, world uh, this is uh, uh, as simple as basically identifying which segment needs to be uh, activated at the branch location uh, and at that time all of the plumbing will automatically happen. So it will be installed on the uh, retail store location. All of the networking will be facilitated towards uh, the device uh, in the, the field. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, so the, the question was uh, like uh, can you extend the segmentation into uh, uh, data center locations? So uh, yes, um, so uh, um, the segmentation usually breaks out at a hub site. Uh, the hub site is something that's a physical edge or a virtual edge device. So a virtual edge device you can deploy into uh, Amazon as well uh, and then you can attach like a network to a physical interface. So that is uh, an option today. Yeah, so the, the, the question was around um, like are these all, uh, these edge devices are physical appliances? Uh, so no. Um, so we do offer like a, a series of like physical appliances today and that is uh, primarily there to provide that zero touch deployment in stores or like in branch locations, right? So that uh, we have like a very controlled and polished deployment cycle uh, there. Uh, but we do have virtual appliances as well. So we support uh, OVA images for VMware, uh, ESXi of course. Uh, we also have like QCA2 images for uh, supporting KVM capabilities. So those are all available. Yeah, correct. So, like all of the deployments happen today on uh, standard x86 hardware. Uh, like for virtual edge deployments, uh, we usually recommend at least uh, two virtual cores to be deployed uh, for like minimal uh, performance uh, guarantees. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, I think the, the question was around like uh, filtering capabilities between two VLANs or segments or did I? So um, like you, right, so the, uh, the segments uh, that you see over here, they are strictly segregated segments. So, so there is no capability of actually uh, within the SD1 overlays to uh, leak traffic in one segment or another segment. Uh, but you can facilitate that um, through the centralized firewall. So that is a very easy way. So like if you do need to exchange traffic between one segment and another segment, we do recommend to have like a full UTM appliance uh, on the data center side to facilitate that. Right, I think I'm running uh, a little bit out of time, so let's uh, jump into um, QS network. So, uh, as I mentioned, Frank uh, was uh, unfortunately not able to uh, get here today, but QS is one of our uh, premier partners uh, that we work with uh, um, on a regular basis. And QS actually um, um, differentiates itself uh, by having almost uh, uniquely uh, deploying the VLOCloud uh, NSX SD1 solutions today. So that's a, a unique proposition that they have in the market. Uh, and they offer like a variety of additional services on top of the uh, NSX SD1 services today. So they've got about uh, 20,000 sites deployed and they actually work with a lot of uh, large service providers uh, today as well. Uh, and they uh, recently actually expanded a, a brand new NOC, uh, 5,000 square feet uh, NOC that they brought online. Uh, they're fully staffed uh, and it's a US based company so all of the US time zones are covered uh, at this point but uh, one of the 
key things that uh, QoS will actually do is they will proactively monitor all of the circuits, right? So we looked earlier at like the uh, quality of experience uh, screens where you can look at how the, uh, the links are actually performing on a real time basis. Uh, and we can actually uh, let QoS actually make tickets open to the service provider if we do see impairments as well. Skip this in the interest of time. Um, so uh, Trunk is a um, uh, media company that uh, QS has been working with. So they uh, started looking at doing hybrid deployments. They had uh, MPLS deployed only uh, today, uh, very problematic. They saw a lot of outages uh, with their MPLS network and uh, QS basically like deployed an NSX as uh, the one solution there uh, and complemented that with multiple broadband links uh, so that we can back up the MPLS uh, and ensure that we can do seamless failover in the event that there are like MPLS failures happening at that time. Uh, public storage is another company. It's a U.S. Uh, centralized based company uh, and they offer like uh, um, small storage containers uh, where you can uh, um, store stuff on a, on a, per, a temporary basis. Uh, and the requirement there was to uh, connect uh, 2,500 sites in a relatively rapid uh, time frame. Uh, and uh, QS was actually able to deploy about 70 to 100 stores a day. Um, so that's a very high deployment rate. Uh, they usually had like uh, a person uh, install four sites at the same time. Uh, so multiple engineers will actually go and deploy this site. So it's a very high uh, uh, deployment rate. Uh, USAA um, is um, uh, an insurance company, very large insurance company, and they actually do a lot of uh, the processing and uh, call management from their customers and all of the inquiries of their customers uh, through remote agents. Uh, those remote agents uh, usually work from home, but that means that they work with like a, data, uh, like a broadband circuit, uh, and we need to make sure that their call quality is very optimal. So what uh, USAA did is they deployed like 9,000 uh, remote branch sites where they took the existing uh, 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 broadband circuit uh, that the agent had and complement it with a very small uh, uh, broadband circuit uh, so that there is redundant circuits uh, available as well and make sure that you can have uh, very high quality delivered of voice call. And last but not least, uh, Petco is uh, uh, a pet uh, store in the US that uh, provides like all of the accessories you need uh, to keep your pets happy. Uh, and they uh, wanted to have some uh, detailed uh, integration with ServiceNow. Uh, and QS Network actually provided the interface between ServiceNow capabilities in their ticketing portal and our REST API so that there was an interface uh, in between and uh, we're able to exchange uh, uh, communication between those uh, two interfaces. Uh, last uh, to wrap up uh, the session, I uh, want to make sure that uh, everybody's aware in the room that uh, we do have like HOL sessions running on SD1. So if you do want to get like first hand experience with SD1, uh, go uh, and find uh, uh, the um, hands on lab environment. I think it's uh, the, the north entrance uh, at the beginning there. Uh, you will be able to sort of like get a, an understanding. Uh, we do have like two books available as well. So there were uh, several signing sessions for the SD1 uh, blueprint. Uh, so that's a good uh, book that will give you like an overview of like all of the things that we just talked about, all of the rationales uh, of why you would want to deploy SD1 and like what a feature set that uh, actually accommodates uh, some of these inefficiencies uh, that we saw uh, earlier today. Uh, and I do want to make sure that like fill out your survey. Um, it's also important that we get some feedback on uh, how you thought uh, the content of the session was. Uh, but I do want to thank everybody uh, for taking the time out to head out to Barcelona and uh, thanks for heading out uh, to the SD1 session today. I think that's what I have for you today.